Hello, my name is David Emery, and it is my privilege to be interviewing Dr. Michael Parenti, along with his colleague Peggy Noten, the author of a very important article from Covert Action Quarterly number 54. That article is entitled The Wonderful Life and Strange Death of Walter Ruther. Uh, Michael, welcome to our airwaves. Hello, David. How are you? Okay, good. Uh, Walter Ruther is a name very well known to people familiar with the labor history of the United States, uh, very pe- a name very familiar to people familiar with the history of progressive politics in this country, but uh, not a name that is probably known to a great many Americans in the year of our Lord, 1996. Michael, why don't you begin by explaining a little bit to us about who Walter Ruther was, what his significance was for American society, and why someone may have wanted him out of the way. Well, he was probably one of the most progressive labor union leaders that the United States has ever produced. He also was a man of tremendous intelligence, resourcefulness, and uh, incorruptible. And uh, he built, he helped build, and he became president of the largest union in the Western industrial world, and that was the United Auto Workers. And, uh, And this went on through the 1930s and into the 40s and 50s. Uh, and right into, in fact, the 1960s, when he when he was when he was killed in an auto crash. Uh, I'm sorry, in a in a plane crash, uh, a private plane of his. Uh, as you pointed out, he not only was involved in building a very large and powerful labor union, obviously not something that's going to be uh, pleasing to the powers that be. We'll get into that in a second. But he also used that power on behalf of a great many other causes, such as civil rights, uh, anti-militarism, anti-imperialism. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the specifics of his, uh, uh, yeah. his, his activism outside of union? Yeah, uh, Ruther was hated by the auto bosses because of his labor militancy and his dedication to the workers. He wasn't a union leader who could be bought off. He was one who fought for their interests, and this was enough to hate him, and this got... The Ford Motor Company thugs beat him up once, and there was an attempt on his life. And uh, J. Edgar Hoover uh, stalked him for the better part of 35 years or more um, and tried to block appointments that he was going to be given to uh, federal commissions and committees and things like that. Um, But in addition to that, Walter Ruther also had a larger social agenda, uh, let me quote him. I got this in the article. It's very brief. He said, The labor movement is about changing society. What good is a dollar an hour more in wages if your neighbor is bur- if your neighborhood is burning down? What good is another week's vacation if the lake you used to go to where you've got a cottage is polluted and you can't swim in it and the kids can't play in it? What good is another $100 pension if the world goes up in atomic smoke? So Ruth was that kind of... Um, labor leader who really discomforted the higher circles whose job it is to keep America safe for the Fortune 500 and keep the world safe for global capitalism. I mean, he was militant, and he had not only a dedication to the rank and file and union issues, but a broader class agenda. He fought for racial equality. He fought for environmental safety. He fought against... uh, militaristic interventions by the US he fought against the he fought against the nuclear arms race and was a critic of US policy of constant ex- escalation of the military budget and the nuclear arsenal and he also condemned and came out against the Vietnam war he was critical and his brother Victor even more so critical of the CIA and the CIA's role in using a field that is using AFL front unions down in Latin America to to set up these these puppet CIA finance unions which would undermine the more militant and left unions that existed. AFIELD, by the way, is an acronym for the American Institute of Free Labor Development, which right. uh, is actually uh, oxymoronic because it was exactly... Uh, the opposite. Uh, precisely. Uh, by the way, Philip Agee's, uh, the company, uh, inside the company, a CIA diary goes into AFIELD uh, at considerable length. Uh-huh. Uh, you mentioned that uh, he was very active, in particular, against the Vietnam War, and uh, that he threw the considerable power of his union behind the civil rights movement in the early 1960s. Right. 
Uh, we, uh, and then he also, because he had such differences with George Meany, when the United Auto Workers was part of the AFL-CIO uh, and Phil Green and these other people, these guys were all uh, right-wingers and, and hard-liners on the Cold War, and uh, they're the only ones that would get you know, funneled up into positions of, of, of dominance. And, um, well, he, um, you know, because he had these differences, he broke with the AFL CIO in the mid 60s and he formed the ALA, the American Labor uh, Alliance, with the Teamsters and, uh, and a couple of the smaller unions. And they had, you know, they had a, um, it was a good sized, uh, it was a good sized organization. Of uh, I forget now the membership. I've got it in the article there, but um, the point is that um, it, it gave him a freer hand. He really, he really came out and and uh, started talking against U.S. interventionism and all that sort of thing. Uh, when he died, we're going to get to the circumstances surrounding his death, uh, both politically and uh, forensically, in a few minutes. Uh, Walter Ruther's life, along with that of his uh, brother and uh, colleague in UAW activities, Victor, had uh, been th not only threatened, but had, been, uh, had suffered attacks on it uh, almost throughout the course of his uh, political and uh, labor history. You mentioned in your article that uh, after being fired from the Ford Motor Company for union activities, he spent three years touring the world, including working at uh, an automobile plant in uh, the Soviet Union, and he wrote a letter home encouraging people to say to carry on the fight, which the FBI then deliberately forged into saying, carry on the fight for a Soviet America. And as you point out... Luther right, it was his brother, Victor, who wrote the letter. And his brother signed it, uh, you know, Wall, Wall and Vic, uh, and, <clears throat> or Vic and Wall. And so that letter was then, right, circulated by Hoover. Even though they had the original copy, the doctored version was circulated to members of Congress to presidents of the United States whenever they thought of wanting to appoint Ruther to some kind of blue ribbon commission, you know, to do something or look at something. Um, and in every case, uh, Hoover was able to, uh, to, to block appointments for Walter Ruther. Uh, the course of his uh, activities as a UAW organizer uh, was interrupted by a number of violent incidents, uh, two of them at least, and possibly more, involving uh, people from the so-called Ford Personnel Service. You discussed that in May 1937, he and some UAW colleagues were uh, badly beaten up by some of those thugs. And then uh, in 1938, a couple of the goons forced their way into his home, tried to abduct him, and it turned out that they had been working for a fellow named Harry Bennett, who was Ford's security chief, uh, and yet, neither law enforcement nor uh, the jury in the case of the attempted abduction would do anything about it. <clears throat> That's correct. Uh, the, there was a very lackadaisical prosecution of the thugs, and so nothing was done about it. And, um, and uh, Harry Bennett, as I said, I think, was, was a buddy, a golfing buddy of J. Edgar Hoover. Harry Bennett was a thug. He used to take hardened criminals out of jails and put them to work as Ford security thugs. By the way, uh, their job was to beat up union organizers, including beating up Walter Ruther, as you mentioned. And and Bennett also fed J. Edgar Hoover dossiers on union organizers and labor people, mostly you know about their leftish or communist affiliations. So there was this whole kind of you know iron triangle between between the criminal element the corporate bosses, and the national security state, all of them working together to stop a progressive leader. Uh, in that context, we should perhaps remember that Henry Ford, for whom Harry Bennett worked, was one of Adolf Hitler's earliest and most prominent financial backers. As George Seldes points out, in his landmark work, Harry Bennett was able to employ these criminals for the Ford Personnel Service because he was the head of the Michigan State Parole Board, and he would then parole out many of the nastiest criminals in the state of Michigan who would ply their trade on behalf of the Ford Personnel Service. 
All right. I, I, well, th- I didn't have that in the article, and I wasn't even aware of it. I mean, maybe I did know that, but I know that's very interesting. I knew he had pull. I thought he had links with people in the parole, but, but that may be so. And his word was to these these prisoners, you do what I tell you or you go back to prison. Yeah, I'd have to check so, it. It's in so the, this was uh, a kind of a, you know, it was a kind of almost a blackmail thuggery there. You, you blackmail people into the service of of violence and reactionism. Yeah, uh, in fact, in fascism, that's the Seldes work that discusses that. I'd have to go back and check, but I'm pretty sure he was head of it. Maybe he was just on the parole board, but uh, that's how he was able to get these people to work uh, for him. Uh, You mentioned that uh, even that after the attempted abduction, Walter Ruther was shotgunned and uh, badly wounded, and yet still the police did nothing about it. About ten years later, right, he was shot and uh, while sitting in his home through the window, bullet came. Uh, left his his arm. Uh, never recovered the full use of an arm and a hand. And uh, and um, and not long after, the barely next year, as a, almost a, and and Victor Ruth believes to this day it was a message for Walter. But Victor was shot too, mm-hmm. and he was shot in the head. And uh, and a bullet came in, took off a piece of his jaw, and uh, and and took out one of his eyes. And Victor's still alive today. And, you know, still works. Uh, but he had lived all his life with this this, uh, this terrible uh, wound, and um, and then the Senate, in an unprecedented move, because it was such an outcry at the time, uh, passed a resolution asking or, or directing the Justice Department to investigate these two murder attempts, and uh, Hoover refused to move on them. He just didn't wouldn't do it. He said no federal law has been violated. In fact, there are a whole host of federal laws: the fugitive law, possible kidnapping, uh, possible crossing of state lines, whatever. That's conspiracy. Uh, but he just didn't. And of course, how would he know no federal law has been violated if he didn't even initiate an investigation? So you had that kind of a thing going on. Uh, the the UAW did its own investigation, and and got all sorts of leads and directed them right back to Harry Bennett, right back to Mob, and right back to uh, maybe some law people, too. And and these leads were sat on by the FBI. The FBI went and looked at false leads and or took them and, and, uh, and just simply did what they could to sabotage or stonewall the investigation that UAW investigated. One UAW investigator on the case met a very suspicious and mysterious death when he was out fishing, uh, he'd come up with a lot of stuff. This was a fellow named Ralph Winstead. Right. Uh, was he the witness who uh, had been uh, had provided the police with some uh, eyewitness identification of the suspects in the shooting of Victor? No. The, the, that witness was just a, a neighbor of Victor's who... Um, the shooting of Victor was very suspicious. Are you going, you're going to be reading the article, did you say? Yes, uh, I, w- I will okay. read this. Uh, so I won't um, go into too many details. People will get it. But the, the shooting was very suspicious. And uh, a neighbor gave a description, and the police told him to shut up. You know, he, got, he got anonymous calls telling him to shut up, and he, got, he was so intimidated and all, he finally moved to Florida or something like that. Yeah, by the um, way, the, the article will not be read on the other stations that carry this interview. I am going to read it on my home oh, base station. Oh, I see, I see. But uh, it, it, we should note that uh, this particular incident, again, incident against Victor involved the apparent removal of his dog, which was a watchdog. Right, and that involved police collaboration. The police came repeatedly and told Victor that his dog was disturbing the neighbors. And Victor asked, what neighbors? I'd be happy to talk to them. I saw it. And, in fact, the dog had barked a few nights rather briefly, and the dog rarely barked. And each time Victor went down to investigate, and there was a car parked in front of the house, and then it sped away. And finally, they said, you do something about that dog. They got amazingly insistent about it. And Victor uh, reluctantly gave the dog away. And the very next night is when he was shot. He also had canvassed all the neighbors around. And not one of them complained and said, no, we never even heard the dog now. And, uh, <clears throat> and then, as I say, one of the neighbors who did give a description of the assailants was, was intimidated into silence and actually left the air, the area. We, we might note that uh, J. Edgar Hoover, in, in refusing to follow up on the attacks on uh, Walter Ruther, uh, 
defied the wishes and orders of the United States Attorney General at the time, Tom Clark, the father of Ramsey Clark, who later followed him into the office of Attorney General. Correct. Uh, we uh, should perhaps note, too, here, as we analyze uh, Walter Ruther and what he did and why he had run afoul a of the powers that be, he had also been uh, requisitioned along with Joseph Rao, an attorney for UAW. Am I pronouncing that right, R-A-U-H? Yeah, I think he pronounced it Joe Rao. To investigate uh, uh, radical right-wing activities on the part of the Kennedy administration. Yeah, on behalf of the Kennedy administration. Right. And uh, they, <coughs> Victor Walter and Joe Rao, uh, did say that there was right-wing activity in the U.S. military, and and that there were these hate groups, and that these should be uh, um, somehow stopped. Victor also, you know, played a role in the purging of the AFL of the CIO of left uh, communist organized unions. Unfortunately, I mean Walter did, and that, that's unfortunate. Walter was red baited mercilessly throughout his career, and he thought that by red baiting in return by dumping on the communists that this would somehow establish his credibility it never did that uh, and uh, it did very it did very little to that effect all it did was weaken the CIO and uh, and the AFL CIO and and it was just the CIO at that time and, and deprived them of millions of, of union members and and cut out the more militant and some of the best organized and most honestly run unions were just kicked out because of the red baiting. Unfortunately, Walter fell prey to that sort of thing, which to this day is still done on the left by many people who have to show a bitter, uh, ferocious anti-communism, anti-Sovietism, anti-existing communism, whatever, to supposedly retain their credibility, not realizing that the people on the right hate you whether you're a communist or 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 a progressive or a socialist or an anti-communist leftist or an anti-communist trade unionist they'll still hate you because you make moves against their interests they use the communism to bait and get popular hysteria mobilized but but communism is not the issue it's the question of class interests exactly exactly i personally do not hold the brief uh, for a quote because communism is really a non-existent term not even marx uh, <laughs> well he, that, that was supposed to be the last stage of things uh, I did, never held a brief, for example, for the Soviet Union or the other socialist states. At the same time, they were never the demons we were told they were. And I uh, can vouch that uh, not supporting that kind of system gains you no, no ground at all in this country, politically speaking. You'll still get defecated on both by the left wing and by the right. And not just the, the Soviets or anything like that, but it's just the Communist Party USA, the 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 need to disassociate and distance yourself from the Communist Party USA. And what the CPUSA was doing at that time in the 30s was leading the organizing of industrial unionism, leading the fight uh, against racism and Jim Crow segregation in the South and, and, and calling for peace and all that sort of thing, and, and, and also organizing popular fronts against fascism. So, in fact, the things the communists were doing were pretty good things. I'm reminded of what Dick Gregory once said is, why don't we... Why don't we ever blame something bad on the communists? You know, when I hear about civil rights, I say, oh, the communists behind that. Or I hear about peace and, and disarmament, oh, the communists are behind that. Or the environment, oh, the communists are behind that. Why don't we blame something bad on them? And yet there's so, there was so much of this kind of anti-communism that even people of the caliber of Walter Ruther had to get in and join in on it, felt obliged to do that. Uh, and show he was as firm and loyal and, and anti-communist as anybody else. One of the things That's about playing into the hands of the, of the J. Edgar Hoover's and the, helping to create that very same atmosphere of witch hunting that that gave Hoover his power over the, the American public. Sure. Uh, one of the things that uh, Walter Ruther had in common with two black American leaders, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X is that uh, in the period of time leading up to all of their deaths, uh, different periods of time in each of their cases, uh, the agendas of each of those men had been broadened from their relatively narrow field of specialization in uh, Ruther's case, uh, labor activities, uh, obviously in the case of uh, both Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, 
uh, black civil rights, they had been broadening their agendas to an international agenda and to uh, seeing their respective struggles as joined with and part of a global struggle for social justice and equality. Correct. And a global struggle against certain common enemies. And it was that coalescence that I believe led to the death of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and Walter Ruther. Ruther is maybe less known, uh, but he, in a way, he was he was one of the more powerful and influential uh, Republican leaders. Said uh, somebody like uh, Barry Goldwater, for instance, said that that Ruther was uh, more dangerous than the Soviet divisions. You know, I mean, it was all this kind of. Uh, hysterical kind of stuff. Walter Ruther was more a more greater menace than Soviet Russia might be, but I don't I don't think Soviet Russia was that great a menace, frankly. Mm-hmm. Other members of Congress said he was he was dreaming of establishing a socialist labor government in the US. And Ruther, by the way, did have a whole agenda on nutrition, on federally funded affordable housing, uh national health care, uh government ownership of monopoly industries, worker participation and economic planning he had uh, various proposals for re- redistributing power and wealth, all of which were taken as threats to the ruling class, and, and they certainly were. They certainly were very real threats. And I think that's why in May of 1970, the day after he sent a telegram to the White House and shortly after he had ran a full-page ad in the major newspapers how the U.S. should get out of the Vietnam War and 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 and, and against U.S. interventionism in most places. On May 1970, a rented private plane that he had rented to go off with two other leaders and uh, and his wife and and the two pilots all were killed. And evidence shows that the altimeter of the plane, which which records the altitude the plane is flying at, the altimeter was 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 uh had been tampered with in about seven serious ways and um all sorts of things that were wrong in it the, the rocking shaft and end stone particular bolts whatever a link pin all these things were either the wrong size or installed backwards or were put in incorrectly or it would had been loosened by by deliberate human effort and the investigation showed that the malfunctioning of the altimeter was the cause of the of the um, crash. The two pilots were perfectly experienced. They had flown into this airport before many times under worse weather conditions, and uh, and had uh, you know had a lot of miles, and they were in perfect condition, and they were well rested before the trip. Uh, the other thing was that the uh, runway was incorrectly lit. The only lighted approach lacked a visual approach path, which would allow the plane to come in. Uh, and the main runway had a visual approach, but the ru- one of the runway lights w- had been knocked out at the last minute, so the pilots went off to the side runway. And they came down, and they were probably about 200 feet off because of the way this altimeter had been tampered with. So there's very, very real evidence. And the National uh, National Safety Transportation Board uh, which looked into this uh, whole issue. Um, now, I'm sorry, National Transportation Safety Board um, found the, this, this tampering and, and then ignored it on its own findings and came to no conclusion as to what happened. They just said it was a malfunctioning of the altimeter, and they never said, what, but what caused the altimeter to malfunction? Why would this altimeter have all these defects? The chances of all that happening were were hard to, by, by sheer chance, were hard to believe. Um, In fact, you point out that uh, there was a screw uh, which was loose. There were total, we, we should uh, recap perhaps for the listeners, there were a total of seven different defects with the altimeter, which would have read high by 200 to 250 feet, according to the investigators. Right. And a screw had come loose, and uh, it was tested uh, to see if perhaps the heat of the fire or the violence of the crash could have jolted it loose, and in fact, that was not the case. Right, that's true. And I should also point out something else that was very strange, that is, just the year before, Walter and Victor had been in a rather similar crash going into Dulles in a small private plane. Uh, 
At that time, though, the weather was clear enough that at the last minute the pilots were able to um, elevate it and miss the whatever and, and, and land safely. But it was a crash landing, and, and everybody was banged up and hurt, but nobody seriously. Um, so, and, and that was that, too, that crash also. Uh, it was a crash landing with no casualties, but that was also caused by a defective altimeter. However, you point out that the pilots had noticed this because they had uh, adequate visual means of assessing their height, so they were able to adjust for it. Right, as I just said. And um, and again, but isn't this odd that the same kind of accident with the same kind of malfunctioning altimeter would happen? It should also be pointed out that these private planes are rented out and they have different pilots, maybe two or three or four in one day on the various trips. And for that reason, because it is a rented plane, the pilots uh, demand that the planes be inspected very closely. They're inspected very closely, much more so than ordinary commercial airlines. And uh, so what were the odds of that altimeter being functioning so poorly and going undetected? I, I believe it was tampered with just before the trip on which Walter and his wife went on their fatal voyage. You, um, you pointed out that uh, Glenn Campbell, the famous singer, had taken that same plane on a flight earlier that day with no incident. Correct. And it land, uh, not just the same day, but the, the very flight just before. Ruthers, and, um, and we were again for the audience. There were seven different defects with the altimeter when the plane uh, crashed with Walter Ruther. Yes, and um, Victor Ruther to this day, and uh, Elizabeth Ruther, Walter's daughter, and um, most of the family now are convinced that the the crash was not an accident; it was sabotage. But the New York Times leaped forward with an article saying that no evidence of sabotage, the altimeter was malfunctioning. And that's not true. The report doesn't say anything one way or the other whether there was or wasn't sabotage. And if you read the actual report, there's quite a bit of evidence of sabotage, even just a, just a reading of the report. I mean, Peggy Noten and I, did, did we did some original research. We went through a lot of FBI documents. That proved almost useless, by the way. All the documents, FBI documents, relating to Walter Ruth's death was so heavily redacted that there was nothing to read on them except the little heading up the top, Ruther death, you know, and date or something, and one or two other little half lines in it. R uh, raising the question, of course. So the question is, you know, since, and here it is 26 years after his death, and the FBI still is, what are they hiding in their documents about Walter Ruth's Death. I don't. We don't understand. So we we couldn't really get much investigation in those documents. But just reading the National Transportation Safety Board's report and the stuff in there is 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 mind boggling as to what really happened. So we believe that Walter Ruther was murdered, and he was murdered by very powerful people and interests. The same people who were killing, uh, I believe, the same people who were killing a lot of other. People. We might they may not be directly, but they don't directly necessarily do the job themselves. There's a whole plausible denial. There's a whole use of, of surrogate forces. You know, the CIA and FBI used the black Muslims to knock off Malcolm X, and and the and they used they had two alpha teams uh, ready to hit Martin Luther King, and instead they they made sure a racist did it. You know, they, so they can get other people who are instigated and financed and, and, and give, given reassurances that they'll be thoroughly covered. And, but you know these things are, you know these things are, you know something is going wrong here when there's no investigation, when there's a history of suspicious actions, and when the person has these kinds of powerful enemies. We might want to note, too, that uh, the fatal crash and the previous altimeter defect was on in October of 68. Uh, Walter Ruther was killed on May 9, 1970, the day after he sent a telegram to the White House condemning the killings at uh, Kent State, uh, where students were protesting Richard Nixon's invasion of Cambodia. That got uh, Walter Ruther put right at the top of Richard Nixon's enemies list. Michael, we are all out of time. And uh, once again, I want to thank you and your colleague Peggy Noten for this wonderful piece of investigative reporting. Again, the title of the article for those who would like to hunt this down.
This Wonderful Life and Strange Death of Walter Ruther, co-authored by Michael Parenti and Peggy Noten, right. published in Covert Action Quarterly, number 54, from the fall of 1995. Right. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye, David. Bye-bye now. Hello, my name's Dave Emery, and in this segment, we're going to begin a reading of the article you heard described by Dr. Michael Parenti, the article that he co-authored with uh, colleague Peggy Noten. By the way, Peggy Noten's last name, N-O-T-O-N. This article is about the life and death and probable assassination of Walter Ruther, the very famous, or at least famous to those familiar with American labor history, leader of the United Auto Workers Union. This article is entitled, The Wonderful Life and Strange Death of Walter Ruther. It was co-authored by Dr. Michael Parenti and Peggy Noten. The article was published in Covert Action Quarterly, number 54. That is the issue from the fall of 1995. The first segment of the article details uh, Walter Ruther's travails during the course of his career as a labor organizer. It touches briefly on the circumstances surrounding his death and talks about earlier attempts on not only his life, but the life of his brother, Victor. The article begins, In recent decades, organized labor has endured a serious battering by conservative interests in government and the corporate world. As progressives in the AFL-CIO try to rally their forces, they would do well to remember those few specially gifted union leaders who understood the broader social and political dimensions of the labor struggle. Among such leaders looms the great figure of Walter Ruther. His life and death contain lessons relevant to today's struggle. Rising from the ranks to spearhead the creation of the United Auto Workers, or UAW, Ruther brought a special blend of unfaltering progressivism and efficacy to the U.S. political scene. For this, he earned the wrath of powerful corporate and political interests. On the evening of May 9, 1970, Ruther, his wife, two close UAW associates, and the plane's two-man crew were killed when their chartered Learjet crashed near the Emmett County Airport in northern Michigan. The brief flight had originated in Detroit and was coming in through the mist on an instrument landing when it plowed into the treetops and burst into flames. There were no survivors. A year and a half earlier, in October of 1968, Ruther and his brother Victor had barely escaped death in a remarkably similar incident while flying into Dulles Airport outside Washington, D.C., again in a small private plane. On that night, the sky was clear enough for the pilots to realize that their altimeter was malfunctioning, and at the last moment they managed a crash landing that smashed a wing of the plane but left no one seriously injured. Years later, Victor Ruther, Walter's brother, told us, quote, I and other family members were convinced that both the fatal crash and the near-fatal one in 1968, were not accidental, unquote. Any number of highly placed persons might have wanted Walter Ruther out of the way. Indeed, there is evidence of foul play against him through much of his public life and evidence of sabotage in the fatal crash itself. The next segment of Parenti and Noten's article is entitled, The Early Struggle, and it reads, Eight months before his death, Ruther reflected, quote, The labor movement is about changing society. What good is a dollar an hour more in wages if your neighborhood is burning down? What good is another week's vacation if the lake you used to go to, where you've got a cottage, is polluted, and you can't swim in it, and the kids can't play in it? What good is another $100 pension if the world goes up in atomic smoke? Ruther was the kind of labor leader who most discomforted the higher circles, militant, incorruptible, and dedicated to both the rank and file and a broad class agenda. The son of a German immigrant who was a lifelong socialist and labor organizer, Ruther devoted his life to the labor struggle. In 1932, after being fired from his job at a Ford plant because of his unionizing efforts, Walter departed with Victor on a three-year trip around the world. Their itinerary included a prolonged stint as workers in a Ford plant in the Soviet Union. Writing to a friend back in the States, Ruther described Soviet Soviet society in enthusiastic terms. The letter, which he signed Vic and Wall, later was doctored in a number of places. Most notably, its closing comment, carry on the fight, was changed to carry on the fight for a Soviet America, unquote. The FBI had the original letter written in its internal files, but circulated only the Ford one to political leaders, corporate heads, and rival unionists in an attempt to show that Walter was a communist tool. Returning to Detroit in late 1935, Walter, 
and Victor emerged as leaders in the often bloody struggle against the automotive bosses, winning landmark victories against Chrysler, GM, and Ford. In May of 1937, during a major leafleting effort, Ruther and dozens of other UAW organizers were assaulted by Ford's thugs. Testifying at a federal hearing, Ruther described how he and his companions were repeatedly punched, kicked, and slammed against the concrete floor, then thrown down several flights of stairs while the police stood by doing nothing. In April of 1938, two masked gunmen forced their way into Ruther's Detroit home during a party and attempted to abduct him. While they were trying to beat Ruther into submission, one guest managed to flee and summon help. The assailants were eventually arrested, but their trial proved to be a sham. Facing a jury packed with Ford sympathizers, the defense argued that Walter had staged the whole event as a publicity stunt. The state prosecutor neglected to mention that Ruther's organizing activities had made him a target at Ford, and that both of the accused recently had been working for Ford security chief Harry Bennett. The jury acquitted the two men. No one could claim that another attack a decade later was staged. In April of 1948, Ruther was nearly killed by a shotgun blast fired through his kitchen window. He suffered chest and arm wounds and never recovered the full use of his right arm and hand. An attempt on Victor Ruther's life the following year suggests outright complicity by law enforcers. Victor began receiving calls from the Detroit police telling him that neighbors whom the police refused to name were complaining about his dog barking. In fact, the dog had occasionally barked at night. When Victor would go out to investigate, he would see a parked car start up and speed away. After the police issued a, quote, final warning, unquote, the family reluctantly gave their pet to some friends. The very next evening, Ruther was shot in the head as he sat reading in his home. The bullet took out his right eye and parts of his jaw. A neighbor who volunteered a detailed description of the assailants to the police was never contacted for follow-up questioning and began receiving anonymous phone calls warning him to shut up. And uh, I would note, too, in a footnote there, according to Victor, Ralph Winstead spent eight years investigating the Ruther shootings for the United Auto Workers. In December of 1957, Winstead's body was recovered from Lake St. Clair. His death was declared, quote, accidental, unquote, and no investigation was made. Continuing with the main text of the article, Two days after Victor was shot, the U.S. Senate unanimously adopted a resolution requesting the FBI to investigate both attacks. U.S. Attorney General Tom Clark, the governor of Michigan, and the UAW itself also demanded an investigation. Although Attorney General Clark, FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover's putative boss, pointed to possible violations of the Fugitive Felon Act and several other federal statutes, Hoover refused to move, claiming a lack of jurisdiction because no federal laws had been broken. Neither the FBI nor the Detroit police followed up on any of the leads uncovered by UAW investigators, nor did they come up with any of their own. No corporate officials were ever questioned. Ford strongman Harry Bennett, who had been implicated in the 1938 attempt against Walter, was never interrogated. In fact, Bennett was Hoover's golfing buddy and was considered a valuable ally who gave the FBI access to his files on, quote, communist, unquote, activity, consisting mostly of dossiers on labor activists. At the end of 1949, an attempt to bomb UAW headquarters in Detroit was filed by an anonymous call to a Detroit Times reporter. According to the caller, the explosive was, quote, planted when the big guy, Walter, was in the building, unquote. Investigations conducted by the police and the FBI produced not a clue. Under Ruther's leadership, the UAW not only grew into the largest union in the Western world with 1.2 million members, but it also became a powerful political organization. By 1952, as president of both the UAW and the entire CIO, Ruther had become, in the words of one historian, quote, the most influential labor figure in the country, unquote. He used his position to promote progressive stances on a wide range of domestic and foreign policy issues. UAW locals around the country formed political action committees that lobbied lawmakers and helped elect candidates friendly to organize labor. At the same time, Walter and his brother Roy were building allegiances between labor, church, and civic groups and ethnic minorities. Throughout the 1960s, the UAW lent financial and moral support to the civil rights movement. Ruther worked closely with Martin Luther King, Jr., joining him in all the great civil rights marches and serving as a longtime member of the NAACP's board of directors, whose meetings the FBI routinely bugged. Ruther sparked the creation of a citizen's board of inquiry into hunger, and malnutrition. In 
The board's findings that millions of Americans were not getting enough to eat spurred Congress into enacting reforms. The UAW leader pioneered, of, pioneered a variety of innovative programs, including employer-funded health and pension plans, cost-of-living allowances, and a guaranteed annual wage. He fought for federally funded affordable housing, nationalized health care, government ownership of monopolistic industries, worker participation in economic planning, and other proposals for redistributing power and wealth, all of which were taken as threats to ruling class interests, as indeed they were. Under Walter and Victor's leadership, the UAW became one of the strongest proponents of the 1963 Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. UAW members marched in peace demonstrations and voted funds to support anti-war campaigns. Abroad, Ruther was the U.S.'s best-known and best-liked labor leader in a number of non-aligned countries. In India, he told an appreciative audience that U.S. foreign policy in Asia placed undue emphasis on military power and, quote, doubtful military allies, unquote, to the neglect of, quote, reliable democratic friends, unquote. These activities earned Ruther powerful political enemies. During the 1956 presidential campaign, Vice President Richard Nixon told Republican stalwarts that the UAW leader, not Democratic presidential candidate Adlai Stevenson, was, quote, the man to beat, unquote, because of his organizing power and, quote, big money, unquote. In 1958, at a GOP fundraiser, Senator Barry Goldwater declared that, quote, Walter Ruther and the UAW CIO are a more dangerous menace than anything Soviet Russia might do to America, unquote. Other members of Congress warned of Ruther's, quote, dream of establishing a socialist labor government in the U.S., unquote. A double-page ad in the Wall Street Journal echoed the same theme. Under an inch-high headline reading, Will You Let Walter Ruther Get Away With It, unquote, the ad warned, quote, Walter Ruther is already within reach of controlling your Congress. The American labor movement has now become a political movement with the objective of establishing a socialist labor government in control of the economic and social life of this nation, unquote. For his activities at home and abroad, as Victor recalled, quote, the right wing never lost its violent, bitter taste against Walter. Nor did J. Edgar Hoover, who stalked Ruther for some 40 years using undercover informants and illegal bugging equipment. Hoover successfully blocked Ruther's appointment to several presidential boards and commissions by secretly circulating disinformation packets to the White House and members of Congress, featuring the doctored, quote, for a Soviet America letter, and testimony by individuals falsely accusing Walter of communist affiliations. During World War II, Hoover made preparations to put all three Ruther brothers in custodial detention. He was ultimately dissuaded from doing so by John Bugas, B-U-G-A-S, chief FBI agent in Detroit. Both the CIA and the FBI monitored Ruther's foreign travel, taking note of public comments of his that, quote, might be construed as contrary to the foreign policy of the United States, unquote. In his early Detroit days, Walter had formed an alliance with communists within the Union in order to combat conservative labor factions and company bosses. In 1938, he severed this association, and some years later, after gaining control of the UAW board, he launched a purge of dedicated UAW organizers who were communists or close to the party. In 1949, he played a key role in the expulsion of 11 CIO unions accused of being communist-led. Over the years, Ruther denounced communism at every opportunity, seeking to legitimate, to legitimate his own status as a loyal American. But for the industrialists, financiers, and leading politicos, it made little difference whether their wealth and power was challenged by, quote, communist subversives, unquote, or, quote, loyal Americans, unquote. It was not an obsession with communism that caused them to hate and fear Ruther, but an obsession with maintaining their privileged place in the politico-economic status quo. At the same time, Ruther was critical of right-wing radicalism. In 1961, Attorney General Robert Kennedy asked him, Victor, and Joseph Rao, R-A-U-H, an attorney for the UAW, to investigate the, the ultra-right. Walter was a close friend and advisor to the Kennedys. The resulting report warned of radical right elements inside the military and urged the president to dismiss generals and admirals who engaged in rightist political activities. The report also faulted J. Edgar Hoover for exaggerating the domestic communist menace at every turn, unquote, thus contributing, quote, to the public's frame of mind upon which the radical right feeds, unquote. From the first days of the AFL-CIO merger in 1955, irreconcilable political differences existed between Ruther and AFL-CIO President George Meany, a Cold War hawk. Under Meany, 
The AFL-CIO had entered an had entered an unholy alliance with the CIA in order to bolster conservative, anti-communist unions in other countries. These unions, Victor Ruther concluded, were run by people who were quote well soaked with both U.S. corporate and CIA juices. It was in effect an exercise in trade union colonialism. Unquote. In early 1968, the UAW withdrew from the AFL-CIO and joined forces with the Teamsters and two smaller unions to form the Alliance for Labor Action, or ALA, with a membership totaling over four million. The Teamsters gave Ruther a free hand on political and social issues. With Nixon in the White House and the bombings in Indochina escalating to unprecedented levels, Ruther ran ads in the national media and appeared before congressional committees to denounce the war and call for drastic cuts in the military budget. While the AFL-CIO proclaimed its support for Nixon's escalation of the war and his anti-ballistic missile program, the ALA lobbied hard against both. Nixon's invasion of Cambodia and the killing of four Kent State students prompted Ruther the day before his death to telegram the White House condemning the war, the invasion, and, quote, the bankruptcy of our policy of force and violence in Vietnam, unquote. By 1970, Ruther was seen more than ever as a threat to the dominant political agenda, earning him top place on Nixon's enemy list. The struggles of Walter Ruther's life provide ample cause to give more than cursory attention to the questionable circumstances of his death. First, as president of the largest union in the country, Ruther had the resources for advancing his causes on the national scene, as did few others. He was an extraordinarily effective proponent of socioeconomic equality and an outspoken critic of the military-industrial complex, the arms race, the CIA, the entire national security state, and the Vietnam War. For these stands, he earned the enmity of people in high places. Second, in the years before the fatal crash, there had been assassination attempts against Walter and Victor. Victor believes the attempt against him was intended as a message to Walter. In each of these instances, state and federal law enforcement agencies were at best lackadaisical in their investigative efforts, suggesting the possibility of official collusion or at least tolerance for the criminal deeds. Third, like the suspicious air crash a year and a half earlier, the fatal crash may also have involved, have involved a faulty altimeter in a small plane. It is a remarkable coincidence that Ruther would have been in two planes with the exact same malfunction in that brief time. Fourth, and most significantly, the National Transportation Safety Board investigation of the fatal May 1970 crash turned up disturbing evidence. When investigators disassembled the captain's altimeter, they found no fewer than seven abnormalities. Most significantly, investigators found a brass screw lying loose in the altimeter case. Although the report notes that with a loosened screw, quote, the altimeter would have read high by 225 to 250 feet, unquote, the investigators did not say who or what had loosened it. They did, however, manage to eliminate the crash itself as the cause. The screw, quote, locks the movable aluminum calibration arm in place when the instrument is calibrated. The threads within the screw hole were torn and ragged. Deposits of aluminum particles were observed on the threads of the screw. Testing to see if the heat of the crash might have caused the screw to come loose, investigators placed a similar calibration arm mechanism in an oven and heated it for two hours at 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. Quote, this screw was found to be tight when examined, unquote. When the test screw was removed, quote, aluminum deposits were found on its threads. The hole from which it was removed displayed torn and broken threads similar to those of the accident calibration arm, unquote, indicating that the loose screw in Ruther's plane had been unscrewed and not forced loose by the crash. Since the crash itself did not cause the screw to come loose, it must have been removed or loosened by deliberate human effort. Further examination revealed six other unusual defects in the altimeter. One, an incorrect pivot was installed at the end of a rocking, in one end of a rocking shaft. An end stone was missing from the opposite end of the rocking shaft. A ring jewel within the mechanism was installed off center. A second rocking shaft rear support pivot was incorrect. The wrong kind of link pin, which holds a spring clip in place at the pneumatic capsule, was installed. An end stone, which supports a shaft within the mechanism, was installed upside down. The odds that this many abnormalities could accidentally or coincidentally appear in a single altimeter are extremely low. With notable understatement, the investigators concluded that, quote, such conditions undoubtedly caused extensive friction in the altimeter mechanism. The board believes that while the evidence is not conclusive, the captain's altimeter was probably reading inaccurately. Unquote. There were other problems. 
The pilots chose the only lighted approach, Runway 5, but it lacked both runway and identifier lights and a visual approach path indicator. VAPIs give pilots their proper flight angle and help determine altitude. The main approach, Runway 23, had a VAPI, but one of the runway lights was out. That the pilots were not notified of this fault, as is customary, suggests that the light broke near to landing time. In its opening synopsis, the NTSB report emphasized the, quote, lack of visual cues, unquote, as a cause of the accident. But the synopsis is misleading. The body of the report noted that in the absence of sufficient visual cues, quote, use of the altimeter is a necessity, unquote. And if the pilot was using the altimeter to determine altitude during the approach, then, quote, lack of visual cues for altitude determination must be considered to have had little effect, unquote. However, quote, an altimeter which read too high, unquote, could have caused the pilot mistakenly to think he had sufficient altitude for a safe landing. Quote, in view of the condition of the captain's altimeter, such a situation is highly possible, unquote. Aside from the altimeter, the report found no other defects in the aircraft. The Learjet, quote, was properly certified, certificated, and airworthy, unquote, and, quote, there was no malfunction of the aircraft prior to the accident, unquote. Nor was there evidence of crew incapacity or error. Medical records and post-mortem examinations of the pilot and first officer found no evidence of disease or physical disability, and both crew members had been free from flight duties for approximately 24 hours prior to the flight. Captain George Evans had more than 2,000 hours of flight time on Learjets and more than 140 hours in the previous three months. And both pilots had flown into the Pelston Airport many times under far worse conditions. An Associated Press story carried in the New York Times under the headline, quote, No Sabotage Found in Ruther Crash, unquote, stated that the NTSB, quote, said today that it had found no indication of sabotage to explain the jet air taxi crash, unquote. The time story is seriously misleading. In fact, the final NTSB report utters not a word about sabotage one way or the other. It notes how numerous unusual defects in the altimeter may have caused a malfunction, but it says nothing about what caused the defects themselves, except to rule out crash heat as a factor in disassembling the locking screw. The report never asks whether the altimeter was tampered with, yet it proffers a good deal of evidence to suggest that it was. In effect, the investigators ignored their own findings. Earlier on the day of the fatal crash, the same ill-fated Learjet carrying popular singer Glenn Campbell had flown into Detroit with no report of a faulty altimeter. Victor Ruther noted that there was sufficient time between flights for tampering with the altimeter. He also pointed out that because, there have been so, because they have so many clients and different pilots, rental planes are inspected with unusual care and frequency. The pilots demanded as much. It is unlikely that an altimeter with seven defects would have gone undetected if properly inspected before the flight. Victor added, quote, I was never convinced that there had been a thorough investigation by federal authorities. There had been too many direct attempts on Walter's life, and there was too much evidence of tampering with the rental plane, unquote. In a follow-up interview, Victor, Ru Victor Ruther further noted, quote, Animosity from government had been present for some time before the fatal crash. It was not only Walter's stand on Vietnam and Cambodia that angered Nixon, but also I had exposed some CIA elements inside labor, and this was also associated with Walter. Although Walter knew I was right, he felt that I had put him in an impossible position. He said, quote, You're take on, taking on an agency that can forge any document to prove we are liars, unquote. But I think he was glad to see the information come out. Checking into the vendetta is no easy task. The FBI still refuses to turn over nearly 200 pages of documents, including the copious correspondence between field offices and Hoover regarding Ruther's death. And many of the documents it has released are totally inked out. It is hard to fathom what national security concern is involved or why the FBI and CIA must still keep so many secrets about Walter Ruther. Ruther's death appears as part of a truncation of liberal, and radical leadership that included the murders of four other national figures, President John Kennedy, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., and Senator Robert Kennedy, and dozens of leaders in the Black Panther Party and in various community organizations. Whether Ruther's death was part of a broader agenda to decapitate and demoralize the mass movements of that day, or whether such an agenda existed at all, are questions that go beyond the scope of our inquiry. But Victor's belief shared by Walter's daughter, daughter Elizabeth Ruther Dickmeyer and other members of the family that the crash was no accident does not seem implausible.
Despite the limited investigation, there is enough evidence to suggest that foul play was involved. The death of this dedicated and effective progressive labor leader raises disquieting questions about the criminal nature of state power in what purports to be a democracy. I've been reading an article by Dr. Michael Parenti and his colleague Peggy Noten entitled The Wonderful Life and Strange Death of Walter Ruther. This is from Covert Action Quarterly's issue number 54 from the fall of 1995. Listeners who would like to contact Covert Action can do so at the following address. Covert Action Quarterly is located at 1500 Massachusetts Avenue, Northwest, room 732, Washington, D.C., 20005. Once again, the address for Covert Action Quarterly, 1500 Massachusetts Avenue, Northwest, room 732, Washington, D.C., 20005. Listeners who would like to contact me by email, I now can do so now. I now have an email address. The email address to contact me at, all lowercase letters, dmory, D-E-M-O-R-Y, at well, W-E-L-L, dot C-O-M. Once again, my email address, dmory, D-E-M-O-R-Y, at well, dot com. Listeners who would like to correspond with me should do so at the following address, and that is uh, listeners who would like to use, quote, snail mail, unquote, write to my attention, my last name is E-M-O-R-Y, at care of, I should say, K-F-J-C-F-M, Kangaroo Fred John Charles F-M, 12345, that's 12345, El Monte Road, capital E-L, capital M-O-N-T-E Road, that's in Los Altos Hills, Zip code 94022. Once again, write to my attention, and my last name, E-M-O-R-Y, care of KFJCFM, 12345, El Monte Road, capital E-L, capital M-O-N-T-E Road, that's in Los Altos Hills, 94022. Of course, that's in California. Very shortly, I will have a new address for people to contact with regard to the half-hour segments. The, this is not the address to which people should write for the archive shows, but rather very soon I will have a new address for the half-hour segments. Those are now going to be distributed by someone other than Archives on Audio. So please stay tuned for that. That concludes this segment. My name is Dave Emery. Thanks for listening.